So we spent a bit talking about the big five and how to put these five groups or types of groups on benzene. But what if you want something else on benzene? There are a lot of things you can do with just these five groups, but sometimes you want to put something else on in a quick, efficient method. In comes coupling reactions. Coupling reactions involve organometallics. Yep, yep, organometallics. These coupling reactions are often used when other methods fail, meaning if you want to put this piece and this piece together to make a bond, if a traditional SN1 or SN2 or E1 or E2 or addition reaction, something doesn't work, you can maybe use a coupling reaction. We'll see. They have many different names based on who discovered them. I'm going to tell you what the names are, but knowing the names of them does not matter to me. It's not something that I feel like you have to know. But if you ever see that name somewhere, maybe it will ring a little bell. That That's familiar. I've heard that before. Um, I put this here as a note to self to remember to say, Coupling reactions are usually considered one of the holy grail reactions. What are the holy grail reactions? Carbon-carbon bond forming reactions. And so these coupling reactions we're about to go through all make carbon-carbon bonds. To a slide we've seen before, carbon is typically an electrophile because it's typically connected to an atom more electronegative than carbon, leading carbon to be partially positive, so electrophilic. But carbon can be a nucleophile if it's connected to something less electronegative than it, leading the carbon to be partially negative. We've seen this before when we saw Grignard reagents. Remember that magnesium squeezes itself between that carbon and Br? And lithium hooks up himself to that carbon instead of the Br? The Grignards, that's his top one, and organolithiums. Those are the two most common organometallics. Those are the two most reactive organometallics. But what if you want a less reactive organometallic? Do you remember why lithium and magnesium were the most reactive? Because those were the least electronegative metals. So if you use a metal that's more electronegative than those, you can make different organometallics. So if we add cadmium chloride, what can happen here is the magnesium is exchanged for a cadmium. So the cadmium here has two ligands. It has two chlorines connected to it. So when it hooks up with the carbon group over here, it's going to need two carbon groups connected to it to balance out cadmium's plus two charge. Chlorine's a minus one. That means cadmium's got to be a plus two. To balance that out, it reacts with two equivalents of your carbon-containing thing. Okay, copper can do the exact same thing that cadmium does. This is a copper one salt, but copper does something a little bit stranger, that copper also connects two ligands, two of your copper groups, becomes a copper minus, weird, I know, a copper minus and a lithium plus. This is a cation anion salt thingy down here. Okay, so this process is called transmetallation. What do we need to know about it? you can turn more reactive organometallics into less reactive organometallics. Why might you want to turn more reactive organometallics into less reactive organometallics? Well, you can do milder, gentler reactions with these less reactive organometallics. We'll see. This thing down here, I will usually call a lithium dialkyl cuprate, but it's also called a Gilman reagent based on Mr. Gilman. Um, so why are we talking about this stuff now? Well, this is a benzene connected to a, gro a Grignard. This is a benzene connected to a lithium. Then you get benzenes connected to copper and cadmium. So these copper and cadmium connected to benzenes are good ways to react with other things and get something stuck to the benzene overall because we're all about benzene, this unit, right? Yeah. Here's a Gilman reagent. This Gilman reagent can react with an alkyl halide. I'm going to draw a thing, and you may draw this same thing, but you're going to listen and pay close attention when I say the mechanism is not fully understood. I'm going to draw it like this. Ooh. That looks like an SN2 reaction. It is not legitly an SN2 reaction. It is 
not legitly an SN2 reaction. You heard me? Mm -hmm. The mechanism is not fully understood. It's believed to involve something radical. There is a lot of evidence for potentially involving radicals, but we're not going to go through that. I'm drawing this curved arrow, this incorrect curved arrow, to show you that one of my benzene groups, ends up connected to the carbon group that was connected to the halogen. One of my benzene groups ends up connected to the carbon group that was connected to my halogen. With those big five reactions, could we put an alkene directly on benzene? No, we couldn't. We could put a carbon group on benzene and then maybe manipulate that carbon group somehow. But friedel crafts alkylation, you cannot directly alkylate an alkene keen onto a benzene. So coupling reactions lead to, or coupling reactions allow you to do things that are not traditionally doable with those big five or with other reactions as well. So while we're talking about coupling reactions, we're going to talk about some other things. But this stuff, to me, really does fit in with the benzene chapter, even though it's in a different chapter in a textbook, I know. But it really does fit in with the benzene chapter because it's ways to add things to benzene all you got to do is have an alkyl halide. This thing over here, hope oh, laser's not showing up, but this reactant on the right um, could be any sort of alkyl halide. All kinds of alkyl halides can react with a dialkyl cuprate. So really, both of these pieces came from an alkyl halide. It's just, it took a few steps. We had benzyl bromide, bromobenzene, and we added lithium, solid lithium, to get a lithium, um, organolithium. Then we added copper iodide to get our lithium dialkyl cuprate, our Gilman reagent. Both of them were alkyl halides. We know a lot of ways to make alkyl halides. Yeah. Okay, I digress. It doesn't matter what is connected. The copper always has to have two groups connected to it, two ligands. This is two methyls. The last one was two benzenes. It doesn't matter. The copper always has to have two groups connected, but only one of them takes the place of the halogen. The copper always has two groups connected, but only one of them takes the place of the halogen. This reaction, these reactions, are very cool to a nerdy organic chemist. Because you can replace that halogen directly where it was. You started out with a cis double bond. You end up with a cis double bond. You start out with a trans double bond. You end up with a trans double bond. The configuration of the double bond is retained. So that leads us to say there's something special magical going on here. But the mechanism is not fully understood. So, meh, we get to move along. Mm -hmm. Organocuprates can be used to prepare compounds that cannot be prepared by using nucleophilic substitution. This is an aryl, mm -mm, this is a vinyl halide. You cannot do SN1 on a vinyl halide. You cannot do SN2 on a vinyl halide. So things that are not traditionally doable with our SN1, SN2 type mechanisms, you can do with the lithium dialkyl cuprate. Yeah, okay. Coupling reactions like these work in the presence of other functional groups. I've got this ketone here, but I don't care. This thing is worried about taking place of the BR. That's all that happens. You don't worry about the rest. You just take the place of the halogen. Organocuprates are some of the most flexible reagents we will talk about. We won't see as many of those as we see Grignard reagents and organolithiums, but they're some of the most flexible reagents you will see. Organometallics are a newer area of organic chemistry, and so the textbook chapter on organometallics is kind of thin, it's because it's just now sort of making its way into textbooks, into standard organic textbooks. There have been organometallic books for a long time. And it's just now making its way onto ACS exams and MCAT exams and things like that because it's a process to get all that started. Some of the other organometallic reactions that you might see on those um, MCAT, ACS, DAT kind of things are the Suzuki and Heck reactions. Suzuki and Heck must start with an aryl halide or a vinyl halide. Why are we putting this in the benzene chapter? Because aryl halide is one of the requirements or a vinyl halide. Both of them take replace the halogen of a vinyl or aryl halide. Both of them are palladium catalyzed. So 
you will see sometimes when you look maybe on the interwebs, palladium in brackets. That doesn't mean concentration. In Gen Chem, that meant concentration, I know. But palladium in brackets. What that means is that palladium might have one or two or three or even four ligands. That L stands for ligands attached to it. That palladium in the middle with brackets, it's got some ligands on it, but it may not be designated specifically what those ligands are. So Suzuki and Heck definitely have to have vinyl and aryl halides, but, and they both definitely have palladium, but what are the differences in them? Suzuki requires that you have a palladium thing under basic conditions, yeah, yeah, a vinyl or aryl halide and an organoboron compound. And you can make a new carbon-carbon bond. Whatever was connected to your boron gets connected to the thing that was connected to your alkyl halide. <laughs> yeah. This is a figure straight out of the book, which is great and awful. It's so generic that students don't always understand what the heck you are joining together. So let's see if we can look at a specific example here. What I'm doing, what Suzuki does, is it cuts the boron and it cuts the halogen and it stitches the pieces together, making new carbon-carbon bonds. This coupling reaction retains the stereochemistry of your alkene over there. This is a trans alkene. You get a trans product. How does it happen? Well, this one is one that we do know this is the mechanism for that reaction. <laughs> what? This is a crazy looking mechanism. Yeah. Organometallic mechanisms are circular things because it involves a lot of oxidation and reduction of the metal catalyst. So we in organic fo focus on a lot of carbon stuff. We say the metal is just there to get the thing done. Well, the metal is actually the focus of this mechanism and what's happening to the metal in this circle, getting oxidized, getting reduced, getting oxidized, getting reduced. And you just have exterior things like bringing in your alkyl halide. That alkyl halide hooks up to your palladium. It's got to be basic so that you have a basic palladium ligand. Yeah. Then that palladium hooks up with your organoboron compound so that you end up with both of your R groups, the thing from the organoborane and the thing from the alkyl halide, both connected to your palladium, and then eventually they sail off into the sunset connected to each other, and palladium makes another cycle. Organometallic mechanisms are not things that you're going to be responsible for drawing, but they're kind of cool to look at, yeah? So if we go backwards real quick, I've shown you one specific example, but really this um, boron group can be connected to all kinds of things, all kinds of groups. But this, remember, has to be an, a vinyl or aryl halide. So a Suzuki will always result in a benzene directly connected to something that was connected to your boron. Maybe that makes sense? We'll see. The heck reaction, it's also a palladium catalyzed reaction. It also starts with a vinyl or aryl halide. That's the similarities between HEC and Suzuki. But the HEC reaction actually starts with or uses a regular alkene. And one of the hydrogens on the alkene is replaced with your R group from your alkyl halide. That always gives you a trans alkene. HEC always gives you a trans alkene. Without getting too nitty gritty on these things, um, the heck reaction works best when you have terminal alkynes, mm -mm, terminal alkenes. So we could replace this hydrogen because it always gives you trans. That bromine and that hydrogen go away, sail off in the sunset, and the heck reaction brings together your alkene thing in a trans double bond way, like that. The Suzuki and the Hex, they both use palladium. They both use a vinyl or aryl halide. Suzuki, you got to have a boron thing. Heck, you got to have an alkene thing, and you're going to do a trans double bond. Yeah. Here's the heck mechanism. <laughs> Isn't it great? Oh, these circular mechanisms. Yeah. 
they are pretty cool, truly. Um, I laugh, I joke, but they are pretty cool. Um, it's, like I said, the newest growing area of organic, and you can do so many things with these kinds of reactions. We teach an upper-level chemistry, organometallics chemistry class. A lot of bigger schools teach even more than that. Um, cool stuff. A lot of research areas are this, to make very selective molecules, like therapeutic molecules, drug molecule stuff. Cool. While we're talking organometallics, we need to talk metathesis. Metathesis, another mechanism that we're not going to talk about how the mechanism works, but we're going to split an alkene, split an alkene, and join together the things that weren't previously joined together, like that. Mm -hmm. You get E and Z isomers out of this reaction in that one that has E and Z possibilities. Yeah. You can do it in lots of things. It could be two alkenes like this. Split it, split it. If you have terminal alkynes, terminal alkenes like this, which is a requirement, you're always going to get a little CH2 piece, CH2, CH2 piece. And we're going to get E and Z, one, two, three, four, nope, one, two, three, E and Z product of this guy, yeah? One of the most famous catalysts used for this is ruthenium. Ruthenium with these special ligands all around it, and that's officially called a Grubbs catalyst. The Grubbs is a ruthenium. Do you have to know that? Not really. When you see a little ru over an arrow, you think metathesis. I need to hook up some alkenes. Mm -hmm. Grubbs, chop it, chop it. Hook these, hook those. I get an alkene here. And a little CH2CH2 piece. Mm-hmm. Grubbs is not hard to understand. It's got a circular mechanism like um, the Suzuki and Hex did, but I didn't pull this one to show you. Alkenes can undergo metathesis, and that's a Grubbs catalyst that's usually used. It's a Schrock catalyst when you're doing alkynes. So you take two of these alkynes. I don't know why I often write C's and H's when I give alkynes. Chop it. Chop it. Connect the things that weren't connected together before. You get this little piece from those two terminal ends. And you get this guy from the other side. Um, it needs to be a terminal alkyne, just like grubs needs to be terminal alkenes. Mm -hmm. Grubbs uses ruthenium. A Schrock catalyst uses molybdenum or tungsten. <laughs> All those weird little transition metals that we have not mentioned whatsoever in two semesters. All of those are piled into Chapter 11 on organometallics. Yep. That's all for organometallics. See you again soon for more electrophilic aromatic substitution stuff.